I would like to welcome everybody for coming to listen to our very special speaker, Honorable Jack Saada. Last time he came to us was on October 24, 2018. I, I don't forget this date because it's the birthday of my daughter. <laughs> everybody agreed he is among our favorite speakers. We are very eager to hear today some interesting stories of our speaker's life. <clears throat> Before we start, I would like to ask you for a moment of silence in memory of our dear friends, Aviva and Karim Juri, Zahronam Libraha who were very supportive to Women Learning Group and to the whole congregation. They were great friends to me personally for a long, for as long as I am in Montreal, since 1969. I would like to have a moment of silence, please. Okay, thank you. I would like to resume. If you have any question, it is preferable if you put it in the box, if you write it, if you put it in writing. When our speaker finishes, he will be generously ask, uh, answering your questions. And I would like also to announce our next week's speaker will be musical, and it will be our cantor, Daniel Bellolo. You are all invited. So I wish you a very happy session and to enjoy it. I am inviting now our dear friend, Gigi Biton, to tell us about our Honorable Jacques Saada's biography. He has a very interesting biography, as we all expect. Gigi Beton, Bevakasha, Bechabod. Excuse me. The Honorable Jacques Saada epitomizes the North American dream. Born in Tunisia and raised in France, he immigrated to Canada as a young adult and has achieved success in various diverse fields. From teacher to administrator, from linguist and translator to businessman, from consultant in international development to political figure. His first steps in politics include the position of chair of the St. Lawrence School Board for the South Shore of Montreal and becoming the president of the Liberal Party of Canada in Quebec. Elected to the Canadian Parliament in 1997, Mr. Saada was given various high-level responsibilities, including Chair of the Canada-U.S. Joint Board of Defense, known as PJDD, as well as the position of Parliamentary Secretary. Under Prime Minister Paul Martin, Mr. Saada was appointed to the federal cabinet where he held four portfolios respectively. These were democratic reform, leader of the government in the house, Canada economic development and Francophonie. After his political career in 2007, Mr. Saada became president and CEO of the Quebec Aerospace Association and authored an autobiography and novel and numerous articles on world politics. He also sat on an expert panel for the drafting of the economic section of the strategic plan of the Organisation Internationale de la Francophonie. 
Mr. Saada now holds executive positions on the boards of directors of various profit and nonprofit organizations, including the Saint Hubert Airport, the Holocaust Museum of Montreal, the Communauté Séparade Unifiée du Québec, for which he is chairman, and the South Shore Jewish Community, in which he is the president. Mr. Saada is the recipient of numerous recognitions and awards. These include Commandeur de l'Ordre de la Pléiade, which is awarded by the World Association of French-Speaking Parliamentarians, the Queen's Jubilee Medal, and Ambassador for UCAM's Faculty of Human Sciences. The Honorable Jacques Saada is married to Nicole. They have four children and are blessed with 12 grandchildren. So, Bravo. <laughs> Thank you, Gigi. Thank you. Beautiful. Uh, I would like to tell you, Jacques, that I share the compliment you gave me today as a detective with Gigi. She helped me. And Gigi Biton is an uh, ex-teacher of literature of a high school. Is that right? And we all love her. And uh, she, she was the president of the sisterhood. And she also was co-editor of our magazine, Aleno. We all love Gigi and we are proud to have her, our friend and helping us in everything we do in the synagogue. Thank you, Gigi. Gladys. Thank you very much. Thank you. I would like to invite our honorable Jacques Saada to speak to us and we'll all enjoy whatever you tell us would be very <laughs> You're thank you so much. Thank you so much, Gladys. Um, Tell them again, what did you call me yesterday? I liked it. <laughs> uh, I forgot I gave you many names. Which one are you referring to? <laughs> <laughs> they were all good. They were all yeah. good. Thank you very much, Jack. Uh, about the question. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Gigi, for the introduction. Uh, with this kind of listing, I must be getting old. Um, uh, thank you, Gladys, of course, and uh, the committee for the organization of this uh, uh, session of the Women's Learning Group. Um, uh, I would like to say a word about your, uh, the chairman of, uh, of, of the Spanish, uh, Edmo. Edmo uh, is a true leader, and, and I enjoy thoroughly working with him. And together we are making things happen. And uh, that's why the Spanish became a constituency of the uh, Communauté Sefarade Unifié du Québec just a few months ago. It's quite a, quite a feat for both of our organizations. And thank you again, Edmo, for your leadership in this regard. Uh, I, 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 I've seen uh, also, uh, scrolling through the presence, uh, I've seen uh, Rosie, Rosie Schwartz, uh, who is uh, such a valuable member of our board and uh, a valuable contact with the, of course, the, the chairman of the uh, which a person, I should say, of the uh, uh, Egyptian uh, uh, community. Uh, I don't know if Albert is here. Uh, I, I suppose he is. Albert, who is also the official representative yeah. of the Oui, je suis là, Jacques. Je suis là. Ah, bonjour, Albert. Je, te, je me fiche, bonjour. je ne peux pas voir tout le monde en même temps. Là. Non, non, c'est que je, me suis, je, je suis devenu un homme de neige. Ah, très bien. <laughs> <laughs> eh, merci beaucoup à vous tous. Eh, Je suis heureux aussi de, de voir qu'il y a parmi nous euh, le vice-président de la communauté juive de la Rive-Sud, euh, Harry Borner. Harry, hello to you, my friend, and thank you for being so active uh, uh, with, the, with, our, with our striving community. Uh, my friends, uh, I truly have been blessed with a, with a very rich and wonderful life. Um, filled with anecdotes and memories, of course, like all of us. Um, I am extremely uh, humbled by two things, mainly. The first one is that I have a wonderful family. Uh, Gigi mentioned this family. That's, to me, that's, that's, of course, my greatest achievement. And the second blessing I, ha I, I have, and I'm humbled by it, is the fact that I'm now 
well in my, in my, into, into my 70s, and I have known no war. To me, that is such uh, an exception uh, that I, I, I think of it every single day. Uh, that's, that's, that's a very important thing to mention when I talk about my, my own perspective on life and my own perspective on the world. So I'll tell you a few of these anecdotes. And of course, uh, very often it's difficult to differentiate between what is of a personal nature and what is of a political nature. So please bear with me. And uh, of course, as, as uh, uh, Gigi said uh, and, and uh, Gladys said, uh, at the end of the presentation, I'd be more than happy to answer questions. <clears throat> so let me start with a, an anecdote in 1969. We're in, in January in 69. I had just come back from a long stay in Israel where I went to Rupan and so on. And uh, I came back to France where my family was uh, living with the idea of going back to Israel to settle really as, as, a, a, as, a, a, as an immigrant. Uh, in the meantime, of course, I need to make some money to have enough money to start even thinking of going back to Israel. So I became a teacher and I was teaching in elementary school in France. And one of my colleagues became a friend. His name was uh, Marcel. And uh, we, you know, as people of our age, we, we, we spend a lot of time together, listen to music, went to concerts, uh, chased girls. I mean, we, we did the whole thing, which is normal to our, you know, in our age. And one day he invited me to his place. Uh, his mother was inviting us for dinner. And uh, his mother was a fortune teller. I never really believed in that, and I was. Uh, she she wanted to read my 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 uh, my cards, my my life in cards, my future. I refused, and I refused, and she insisted, and I went at her place, so I couldn't refuse any longer. Yeah. To make people and you put this, so I accept. Yeah, that's someone is someone is unmuted here. That's you, exactly. You, you are putting something wrong. No. Well, I someone did. Is, Please mute yourself. What happened? So it's okay. So I decided to 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 agree and you know have fun with it. And she said two things to me. The first thing she said to me was, "I was going to cross the ocean in a very near future." I thought she was wrong because my intention was to go to Israel. So I said to her, "No, you mean I'm going to cross the sea, not the ocean, Mediterranean Sea, the sea, it's not an ocean." She said, "No, no, it's an ocean I'm talking about." Okay. And then, strangely enough, she told me that uh, I would have a very intense and full life, but unfortunately it would be short and I, I would die around the age of 50. Uh, I'm happy to report that on this last account she was wrong. <laughs> uh, but I met Nicole in March, a couple of months after this event. Uh, I won't get into all the details, but... Uh, Nicole moved to Canada. I joined her in Canada at the end of 69. Indeed, I crossed the ocean. And uh, a few months ago, we celebrated our 50th wedding anniversary. So uh, that's the first story. Uh, that's the foundation of my presence here in Canada. And, and I, I found this anecdote to be, to be cute. Uh, second anecdote, I'm going to talk about school board elections. Um, our eldest daughter, and I, uh, I, I see Leon here. Leon is a good friend. We have been friends together since, since 1970, 71. Uh, Jessica, our eldest daughter, uh, was going to enter kindergarten. And I, at the same time, I was leaving teaching because I was getting into translation, into business, and so on. So I wanted to still remain active within school fairs. So I decided to get involved with school committees and so on. I became chair of a few committees. And at that time on school boards, you had uh, the possibility for uh, the sitting members to co-opt anybody to fill in a vacant seat in the course of the mandate, in the course of the term. There was a good friend of mine whose name was Kathy Thornhill. And Kathy was a, a black woman from the Caribbean. 
very dedicated parent, a very dedicated member of our committees. Uh, she decided to apply for this uh, vacancy which occurred on our board. And uh, the board was held by people who forgot to be forward looking uh, and didn't want to have a person of color sitting with them, it was clear. And how they found a way to eliminate her was simply by asking her a question, what did you do during the war? Well, she couldn't do anything during the war, she was a kid. So they rejected their can candidacy and they appointed one of their own. It made me furious. When I say furious, I mean, in the guts, I felt the pain and I felt the rage and I felt the fear. And I decided that I would do something about it. So when the next school board elections came about, I decided to run. And not only in my own area where I lived in Brussels, I decided to go to Longue where I knew nobody to fight in the district of the outgoing chairman of the board. Everybody thought I was crazy. <laughs> Why do you need to go and challenge the president chairman and you know nobody there where you could actually have a better chance in your own district? And I said, no, there is a symbolic value to that. And Justin will, will prevail and I will fight and I will beat him. And I did. I did beat him. But I want to tell you about this story of uh, the actual day of the election. Elections took place in a, in a small uh, in a small place in Longueuil, and Nicole and I and a couple of volunteers were with us for the day of the vote and for the counting of the ballots in the evening. But my group and I had unanimous support from all the schools in my campaign. All of the schools under our board were uh, uh, school committees were uh, uh, were supportive. All my organization was waiting for us and we decided to celebrate no matter what, whether I win or lose, we celebrate. So they rented, we rented a small basement in the church and they all waited for me there, including Kathy Fonzer, including this lady who I, I thought was treated so unfairly. So I won, we take the car and we go back to this church and Kathy is waiting for us outside and we yell through the window of the car we won and she started to jump and jump all over the place she was so happy and she ran she didn't know where to go she didn't know whether to come to us to hug us or whether to go inside to let the people know about the good news she went inside she yelled she came back and she hugged us and it was such an emotional moment it was an emotional moment because a true human value had won fight against racism is not only in the media and on, on, a, on, a, on a broad scale. It's a matter of everyday life. It's a matter of making sure that you seize every opportunity you have to fight against this disease. Because fighting against racism is also fighting against anti-Semitism. And you do that every single day of your life, every single minute of your life. That's a motive of for living, that's, that's a raison d'etre. For me, it is. So, I'm going to go on with another, with another uh, anecdote. And, uh, this one, I'm going to make it very short. And I think someone is talking on the phone at the same time as I am, so it's okay. <laughs> Je sais qui est. Charles, Charles excuse-moi, Jacques. Charles, là-bas, dit, s'il te plaît, mute, mais, mais ton mute. Oui. Enlève ton microphone, s'il te plaît. Ça y est. OK. Uh, the second anecdote, or the third anecdote, is uh, it could, could take a whole presentation by itself, so maybe more than one. It was my first encounter with pierre Elliott Trudeau. Um, I was sitting in my office in, the, in translation, uh, in my translation company, when uh, I got a phone call from Don Johnston. Some of you might remember him. He was a former cabinet minister, from president of the Liberal Party for Canada, a lawyer in the same firm as uh, Trudeau. And he said, uh, Jacques, I would like to invite you. Who would like to invite you to, uh, okay. to uh, uh, a lunch at our office? 
at that time I had just been elected uh, president of the Quebec wing only one, a bit more than one year after I had been involved for the first time with the Liberal Party. So uh, it was like kind of a surprise that I was elected and uh, they didn't, people in the establishment didn't know me much. So he invited me and he said, there will be uh, other people around the table. Marc Lalonde, former cabinet minister. There will be Michel Robert, who was the uh, former president of the, uh, of the party himself and, and a prominent lawyer. And pierre Le Trudeau. Wow, pierre Le Trudeau wants to have lunch with me. <laughs> You know, it, it was it was it was uh, you know impressive, uh, humbling. So we did meet, and after chit chat and so on, we started to talk about things, and uh, we started to talk about so many different things. The lunch was supposed to last an hour and a half; it lasted four hours. We spent four hours talking, Trudeau and myself, with Mark and 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 uh, and Don and, and Michel. We talked about international affairs, like Vietnam and Cuba. We talked about the Canadian Constitution. We talked about, uh, Trudeau asked me what it meant for me to be a Jew, to be a Sephardic Jew. And uh, I explained what it meant to me. It meant to me that uh, I was first and foremost a Jew with a responsibility in terms of values, in terms of honor. When you are a Jew, you have the responsibility of doing much better than anybody else, because if you are not, then it reflects on the whole community. If you do something wrong, it reflects on the whole community. This sense of responsibility is what my parents gave me. And I explained to him that these Jewish values are in fact what attached me to that party in the first place. And I'm not going to talk about politics here, but it is what I felt, it is what I still feel today. And uh, we talked about Sephardi Jews. We talked about the extermination of uh, 40,000 Sephardi Jews in the Thessaloniki in Greece. We talked about uh, the Jews under the French protectorate. Uh, we talked about the Inquisition and, and this kind of, you know, we, we had a long, long conversation. Uh, we talked about Israel, of course. And we talked about the kibbutzim and the ideal they represented at the time. We talked about Israel as being much more than a country, uh, much more than, than simply a geography. We talked about Israel as being part of our flesh and blood, as being the raison d'etre of us Jews, the motive for our survival, the reference by excellence of our identity. I explained what was Israel to me? What is Israel to me? Uh, the meeting which added that after four and a half hours uh, was just once in a lifetime time of meeting. Uh, a few uh, years later, when, when Pierre de Trudeau passed away, uh, his funerals were celebrated at uh, Notre Dame Cathedral in Montreal. And I was sitting on the left side of the aisle and a bit two rows in front of me to the right side of the aisle. You had uh, Trudeau's son and, and, and Justin made a beautiful eulogy to all of us remember. Next to him, there was uh, Fidel Castro. And while Justin was speaking about his father and achievements and respect and all the kind of value that he inherited from him, I was thinking of that meeting and of the emotion that this man had been able to extract from me by asking the right questions and by being truly interested in what I had to say and by the amount of knowledge that this person had about the affairs of the world and his sensitivity about hope. So that was my anecdote. I, can, I, I, I could develop that further, but I'm going to stop it at that for the time. I was finishing my term as president of the Quebec wing of the Liberal Party, it was in 1993. Uh, I repeat that I had been elected against all odds in 1991. Uh, in, in the terms was uh, two years long. 
I wanted to not renew my term because I intended to run uh, for the House of Commons. So we have a convention of the Quebec wing, uh, which uh, takes place in, the, in, in June of 1993. And that is a time, you know, when you have, when you, when you assume responsibilities at the head of an organization, when you leave and, you know, it's customary to have a kind of a reunion, a meeting or something to honor you and so on. In this case, the party did things the big way. Uh, they rented the top terrace of the convention center, Palais des Congrès de Montréal. There were over 600 people present there. There was a 17 musician band. Sheila Cox was there and the lieutenant for uh, Jean Chrétien in Quebec, who was my uh, mentor in politics, uh, for whom I had tremendous respect, Senator Rizzuto. Senator Rizzuto, who had been accused of all kinds of things and who was such an, a model of integrity. This person, Sheila Cobbs, all the presidents of Quebec were here. Every single president of every single writing from Quebec came to that event. And I intended to go to that event in the first place with Nicole and, and Jessica, my daughter. But Jessica was sick, so she said she wouldn't come. So here we are on this terrace. It's a beautiful evening, a beautiful summer evening. And uh, we have dinner and uh, all of a sudden, uh, after the speeches and gifts, I see my daughter come up. I wasn't expecting her. She surprised me. She surprised us. She came, and she came for one sole reason. She wanted to sing for me in front of the 600 people, Summertime, which is one of my favorite pieces of, uh, one of my favorite songs. And my daughter, by the way, uh, is the one who sang the old Canada at the big referendum rally in 1995. Uh, and she, 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 she was semi-pro in, in, uh, uh, at the Seagull Center and so on. Anyways, so she came and she sang Summertime for me, a cappella, no musicians. It was such a moving moment. The evening went on and it was such a warm feeling and, and a beautiful moment. And to top it all, in the evening, there was the fireworks, the international fireworks. We could see the fireworks. So we all got up and went to the, to the side of the, uh, of the terrace. And the musicians started to play music to accompany the fireworks. That was something I have on tape. Tapes are not used anymore, but I have it on tape. It was one of my most moving memories of my family and people, my, my folks, coming together to honor me. And, 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 and it, 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 was, it was really special. And I want to say, this is what politics is all about. It is not about making the front, you know, the, the, the front lines of, uh, of the papers. It is not about uh, celebrity, fame. It is not about uh, uh, being a star. Being in politics means bringing people together. That is the fundamental rule of politics, bringing people together. Once you do that, nothing is impossible. I'd like to uh, continue with uh, one more. Uh, as I said, in 1993, I decided to run for office. And uh, of course, I was running on the uh, South Shore of Montreal. That's where I lived, that's where I had lived since I arrived in Canada. And uh, it wasn't an easy uh, election, as you remember, 1993. That's the time where the bloc was so popular. Uh, I was in the writing where I had to, you know, get myself to be, made myself to be known, which is not an easy thing to do. Uh, one thing 
happened, I mean, a number of things happened, but one thing happened during this election, and it's worth mentioning. Uh, I had been involved with the uh, provincial liberals for a while. I had actually been invited to run for office for the provincial liberals, which I declined. Uh, I declined uh, because simply I didn't know anybody there. It was too early for me. I had no clue that I was going to be involved in politics in any way or shape, even though I was very much interested in following the news and following the uh, political affairs. I had been, by the way, solicited also in 1988 to run for office, uh, but this time for the federal liberals. And I had declined again. I had declined because the head of the party was uh, uh, John Turner. And John Turner was against the free trade agreement with the US and so on. And I'm by nature an internationalist. I'm by nature, I want to build bridges <laughs> and trade helps build bridges. If you look at it only in terms of enrichment of a few, uh, of course there are problems. And of course I would disagree with it. But it's also a means to achieve connections, to build bridges. And that's again, the main focus of politics. So being against this agreement, to me was going against the grain of who I am and who I feel fundamentally. So I had declined already. So here we are in 83, and the Jean Chrétien, and uh, friends, uh, people that I had known, that I met during my tenure as a volunteer with the Liberal Party. Uh, one guy came to me and said, Jack, uh, our community would like to meet you. And he is from the Pakistani community. Of course, Muslim community. And I'm a Jew. And I'm running in an area where you have a substantial Muslim vote and <laughs> maybe a dozen Jewish votes, <laughs> maybe 20. Anyways, I, I accept, of course I accept. And here we are in his basement, large house, in his basement, maybe 45 or 50 people, most of them Pakistanis, some of them also Middle Eastern or, uh, or, or North African uh, Muslims. And I knew no matter what the <laughs> order of things would be in the evening, I knew that a question was going to be raised about my Zionism. And I never made the secret, <laughs> it was very public. So I was expecting the question on this. And I said to myself, well, listen, I am who I am. I believe what I believe. They accept, they accept, they don't, too bad. But that's what it's going to be. And we'll see. So here I am walking into this uh, basement. And surely enough questions about it, the economy of the country and the, plan, the, the program of the party and all kind of stuff. And all of a sudden, one of the guys in the back, um, elder gentleman, got up and uh, asked me, you are running for office for the House of Commons of Canada. You're a Zionist. How would you convince us Muslims to work, to, to vote for you? I took a few seconds. I took a few seconds and I said, all I have to offer you is my truth. I'm a Zionist. I believe in Israel. And Israel to me is a fundamental given of my identity. And I would not change that to gain votes. At the same time, I believe it is normal for Palestinians to aspire to their own country. We Jews know what it is not to have a country of our own. We know what it is, and I recognize this right. And I remind you that at the creation of the State of Israel, at the vote of the UN, there was a decision made to have two states, one which was Israel and the other one for the Palestinians. We have accepted. The Arab world has refused. They would wait 35 or 40 years later to be joyful because finally there was a recognition of some sort of the Palestinian uh, uh, authority 
at the UN, when for 40 years they had the chance and never took it. Am I a Zionist? Indeed I am. Am I pro-Israeli? Indeed I am. I am. Am I concerned with, this, with, with, the, with the fate of the Palestinians? Indeed I am. Do I wish to have these two states work together and, 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 and develop economic, economically together and make the people live finally in peace? Indeed I do. And there was a big silence. And the same gentleman who asked the question after a few seconds, which seemed to me so long, got up and said, Jacques, I will support you. And I got support from these people. And you know what? Until today, I'm in contact with so many of them. And I meet with them and I feel respect from them and dignity and, 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 and a way of talking which, is, which transcends the fact that we met because of in, in, in the political circumstances. They are my friends. I can talk to them. I can disagree with them. I can disagree with them on issues of Israeli politics. But they're my friends. They trust me and I trust them. Next anecdote is my 2000 campaign. In 2000, and by the way, I'm sorry, uh, uh, I, I had not finished with my 1993. The day of voting comes about, I believe it was 25th of October, 1993. And uh, we are with friends, actually some friends came from France. Uh, they were in, in, in our, in our uh, you know, living room, we were watching television, watching the results on television and so on. And uh, television declared me elected. CB, uh, Radio Canada declared me elected. We zapped very quickly to other channels and I was elected. So everybody, of course, is very happy. We got up and we uh, took the cars and neighbors heard about it and so on. And they, they came and we had a whole convoy. We had, uh, you know, a whole motorcade of, of people going to the headquarters of my headquarters. I arrived at the headquarters and my head organizer, who is a friend of mine, has been a friend all along, her name is Ren. Ren came out of the headquarters, directed to me. Her face was somber. And she said, Jacques, you are not going to win. What do you mean? I, I, I always know you're not going to win. There are about 2,000 votes left to come out, and they are all in an area which is extremely in favor of the bloc, extremely separatist. You're going to lose. So, of course, the news spread, uh, you know, talk about an anticlimax. Uh, I stay there with uh, my son, Jeremy. Jeremy, by the way, who had his his at the, the Spanish. Uh, and Jordana, my daughter. My other, uh, Jessica and, and Jacob uh, went with their mother. And Jordana, by the way, who got married to the Spanish. So <laughs> here is a connection with the Spanish. Uh, they stayed with me. And indeed, finally, they announced me defeated on television. So I went on stage to meet with my folks. And I had Jeremy on one side and Jordana on the other side. And they were both crying. And I see people crying in the room. And the only thing I told them was, if you believe you can do good, you will succeed. And therefore, why don't we meet again in four years from now? And this time we will win. And losing is part of life. There are two ways of taking losing. You lose and you depress, or you lose and you gain learning from it. It's all fine and dandy to say these words, but inside me, I was hurt. I was really hurt. So the day after, I go back to the headquarters because of course we have got to empty things, take off all the papers and, and empty the, lo the local. 
And there's a guy knocking on my door, one of my volunteers, a young volunteer, who was 19 years old. His name is Chris. He knocks on the door and says, Jacques, can I speak with you? I said, not now. You know, I was not able to even move my papers around. I was just sitting there. That's it. Uh, he said, I want to talk to you. I said, not now. He said, I want to talk to you. He said, I said, not now. He said, no, no, you don't decide. I do. I want to talk to you now. And he walks in and he sits down on me. And he says something which has marked me for life. He said, Jack, I'm Greek. My parents are Greek. We are from Cyprus. I grew up in a Greek environment. The food I eat is Greek. The friends I made at school are Greek. Because of you, for the first time of my life, I felt a Canadian. I stayed in contact with the guy. Until now, I'm in contact with this person. The campaign of 2000. The campaign of 2000, one Friday, one Saturday morning, very early, in the middle of the campaign. I, I get a phone call. It's almost maybe six o'clock in the morning. And, you know, in election time, you run like crazy. You have so many hours a day, you know, work 20 hours a day, very little sleep. At six o'clock in the morning, I get a phone call. One of my volunteers says, did you see what happened to your, to your signs? You know, we had election signs all over the place. <clears throat> I said, no, what's going on? He said, well, you have all of them defaced with swastikas and stars of David and, and this kind of stuff. Okay. Of course, when Nicole and the kids hear about this, they get worried, they get concerned. Uh, don't forget that it was a time when you had all kinds of uh, uh, manifestations of uh, radicalism around the world uh, against the Jews. So it's not uh, something to be taken lightly. And of course, during the day of Saturday, uh, I'm concerned with this thing, but I want to appease the situation. I want to reassure people, my family first, but also all my volunteers because so many of them were, were really shaken up. So I said to Ren, who is my chief of staff, I said, Ren, will you please call me a meeting of uh, the organizing committee and all the people involved in my campaign, all the volunteers involved for tomorrow morning. I want to talk them all together. And indeed, we, she did. And the Sunday morning, 10 o'clock, uh, I entered that room. There were over 100 volunteers in that room. And it was a very, very somber atmosphere. And I told these people, I said, look, I don't know who did that, for what purpose. And of course, we get concerned and so on, it would be nowhere. And the only thing they want us to do is to give publicity to that, because that's what they are after. So I suggest that instead of answering them, or instead of writing to the media or whatever, instead of making a big fuss out of it, let's win the election. That's the only way we can actually defeat them. We defeat them through the democratic way, and we don't fall into the trap of that they have set up for us. And these people worked so hard. We had them. 11 days, 12 days before elections at the time when it happened. You should have seen these people work. And we won. And we won. And the, one of the first things I said after I thanked everybody in my victory speech was, if you believe you can do good, things will happen. You will make them happen. It takes time. You have obstacles along the way. But at the end of the day, you make them happen. On the Monday morning, just not uh, after the events of the of, of the defacing of my signs and so on, in other words, a week before the election, something interesting happened. 
another one of those things which mark you. I was uh, I was in my office on Monday morning, nine o'clock, trying to prepare my day, and you know how the schedule is full. And uh, the volunteer who was uh, uh, at the reception desk in front comes to see me and says, Jack, someone wants to meet you. I said, do you have an appointment? She said, no, but he insists. I figured it's easier to meet than to refuse. And anyways, so I accept. And in front of me arrives a man, uh, rather tiny, bearded, uh, with a, uh, a traditional uh, uh, Indian subcontinent, uh, you know, uh, dress, modest, very modest. And he comes to me very respectful, very respectful. And he says to me, Mr. Sada, I have, I'm a Muslim from India. I have never been involved with the political party. I never contributed to the political party. But I wanted to tell you that I fundamentally do not agree with what I saw on your, on your signs. I deplore that very much. I'm not rich, but would you please accept this? And he gave me a $20 check and he said, this is to help replace your signs. A Muslim from India was coming to a Jew running in Canada with money to help replace signs which had been defaced by stupid people. This is a marking event. This event, the Pakistani the story that I told you a moment ago, all this make me believe in mankind, make me believe that there is good in mankind. Sometimes it's hidden. Too often it's hidden, but it exists. The next episode I would like to tell you is uh, when I entered cabinet for the first time. Uh, as a member of parliament, uh, I was already, you know, having responsibilities which were fulfilling. Uh, I was in charge of the uh, uh, Permanent Joint Board of Defense Canada US, which is a very high ranking organization. I mean, it is the, the organization responsible for the settling of NORAD, the Air Defense, North American Air Defense. Uh, my, my first assistant from the army was a, a two-star general. I mean, this is, uh, you know, important responsibilities. And they have been given to me by, 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 by Jean Chrétien, by the Prime Minister Chrétien. At the same time, he gave me in, at the same time, responsibilities as parliamentary secretary to the solicitor general. In other words, dealing with the RCMP, with the Secret Service, with the prison and so on and so forth. But I started to have a disagreement with him, with Jean Chrétien. I started to have a disagreement on the two fronts. And one of them was uh, a lunch, that uh, tradition, uh, a dinner that the party holds traditionally in each of the provinces where the leader comes and it's a way to raise money. It's called the leader's dinner. And the leader's dinner in May in Montreal was going to take place a few days after a wave of anti-Semitism. So I had to see, I had gone to see him and told him I would like very much if he could take advantage of this dinner to make a statement against anti-Semitism. And he said, Jacques, it's not a good idea to do that because I'm going to highlight anti-Semitism. I'd rather talk about an appeal to tolerance in our country. And I said, no, if you don't name things, it don't exist. You've got to name it. You've got to do something about it. And he refused. Of course, all that's very respectful. Some other people tried too. Erwin Cutler tried and a number of others tried. And he wouldn't, he, he wouldn't budge. And that's where I started to part. That's why I decided to, I started to think about my allegiance. And uh, I decided to change and support Bob Martin. So in November, 2003, 
Paul Martin is elected at the convention uh, as a new leader of the party. And uh, a few days later, of course, he's going to form his cabinet. And uh, newspapers and he was talking about me as a potential, you know, member of this cabinet. Uh, it was uh, making me very nervous because, of course, imagine <laughs> becoming a cabinet member is, is, is not a small feat. I couldn't believe that. And I was so nervous about it. My family was so nervous about it. So one day uh, is set for him to make the calls. And but he knows that on that day, he's going to make the calls to the members that he has uh, retained to form his cabinet. So at 6.30 in the morning, I'm in my office in Ottawa, and Ren, my chief of staff of forever, <laughs> was there with me. And we're waiting for the phone to ring. And when you're waiting for the phone to ring, you know what it is. Uh, every second likes is like a century. And all of a sudden, the phone rings. I jump on the phone. It was one of my volunteers who were going to, who wanted to wish, wish me well in this day of appointment of cabinet. I hung up so abruptly on him. <laughs> he never knew what happened. And I waited. And surely enough, it was maybe 7, 7.15, when the phone call came in. Uh, it was Paul Martin. And he said, Jack, uh, um, as you know, we are forming cabinet. I need to count on you. I would like you to be our leader of government in the house. And I would like you to, uh, to be in charge of democratic reform. I'm overwhelmed. I mean, leader of government in the house is one of the top jobs with finance and foreign affairs, maybe in, you know, in one of the top jobs. Uh, no bill can pass the House of Commons unless it is approved by the leader of government in the house. Uh, leader of government in the house means that you are sitting automatically on the uh, on the organization which manages the House of Commons. Uh, I mean, it's quite a huge thing. So I'm overwhelmed. And I say, thank you. I said, no, no, it's not over. I want you to be a member of our priority committee. Government Priority Committee or Cabinet Priority Committee is the one who establishes the priorities of government in terms of legislation, in terms of action, and so on. And they are the council around uh, the prime, one of the councils around the prime minister. So, of course, I thank him. He hangs up. I start crying. <laughs> what else can I do? I am a little guy coming from Tunis, from an extremely modest family, modest but with values. Here I am moving to France because Tunisia became independent, going to Israel, looking at going back to Israel to live there. Instead, following Nicole in Montreal, and a few decades later, I'm appointed to cabinet. That's mind boggling. So I, uh, I decide to stay, of course, in Ottawa. I, 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 my my call my brothers i wasn't supposed to publicize that too much before it was announced officially but i knew that you know a few things you could do my brothers in france uh, i have five brothers uh, every saturday they play belot okay they play cards uh, so i knew they were so i called them up and i informed them i let you imagine the reaction before that of course i called my wife and children and so on it was such a moving moment. In the following days, and I, I decided to stay in Ottawa because it, it was a lot to absorb at the same time before the house could be issued and so on. So I'm in Ottawa on a Sunday, and uh, Francis Fox, uh, you may remember him from the cabinet member or two and so on, came to me and said, Jack, he said, uh, I'm concerned about the uh, decision that uh, Paul Martin is about to make concerning the uh, Gomery, creating this commission. And I said, uh, Francis, I'm, I'm, I'm as afraid as you are. Strategically, it's a wrong move because the Gomery commission is going to be on television all day long. And guess who is all day long 
able to watch TV. It is people who have retired and have time, or it is some women, part of them who are not uh, holding a, a paid work. All women work, but <laughs> different between paid work and unpaid work. And these is these are two groups which are very strong supporters of the Liberal Party. If we establish this commission, we're going to damage our brand. And for reasons which have no which have no founding, no foundation. We did nothing wrong. The party did nothing wrong. But if we accept this commission, it is recognizing that the party had done something wrong. So here we are, Francis and I, walking in the streets of Hull, on the phone with Paul Martin, who is in this place in the Eastern Townships, and explaining to him how important it would be not to appoint Gomery. And Paul Martin said, look, I value what you say, but I've weighed up all the options, and I still believe that the best option is to have this commission appointed, and I will denounce tomorrow morning. And uh, it happened. Comes the months of uh, February, when the House is going to resume. And the House is going to resume, which means that you're going to have our first cabinet meeting just a few, you know, a couple of weeks before that. So sometime in mid-January, I have my first cabinet meeting. Let me tell you in a couple of words the feeling it means. I walk up the stairs, I go to this place, and you enter a small hall filled with uh, chief of staffs and, 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 and uh, top-ranking bureaucrats. Uh, uh, all those uh, impacted by the uh, issues which are going to be discussed in the sudden cabinet. And you enter through that, you walk through that, and you have a door, a very simple door. And you open the door. It's a room which is not that big, all wood around. And some, some, some. Uh, uh, pictures and so on, pictures of former, you know, uh, people, uh, the scenes of, of, of uh, Aboriginal people and so on. In this room, history was made. In this room, for a hundred and some years, the history of the country was made. And I was entering this place because from now on, I was going to be part of this history makers. I was going to contribute to the making of history of Canada. That's the responsibility I was given. And I had to make sure that in the execution of my mandate, I would withhold, I would hold up to the values that my parents gave me, to my Jewishness and my responsibility it means, and to the commitment I had made to my folks. Elected me. I entered this room with such humidity. It was so deep. I cannot even find the words to tell you what I felt really. Just walking to a room similar to so many other rooms, to a chair similar to so many other chairs, but where Canada was designing its future. And I was part of it. That to me was so special. We are arriving to May, early May 2004. And uh, you may recall that uh, uh, the election uh, was in the cards. And uh, Paul Martin at Cabinet. Uh, said that uh, he was very much looking at uh, June uh, 28 for the elections. We are in early May. Okay. When a prime minister tells you at cabinet, he thinks about that date, he has already made up his mind. It's just a way of introducing smoothly. So I went to him at the end of the meeting of the cabinet. And I said, Paul, don't do that to me. He said, what do you mean? 
I said, don't do that to me. Don't put this selection on 28th. He said, why? What's wrong? I said, I said, my son, Jeremy, is getting married in New York on the 27th. I have family coming from France for this wedding, and they're already in New York. They would be already in New York. And you tell me that I cannot be with them for my son's wedding just the day before elections? Come on. And he said, Jacques, I think it's a better timing. And anyways, I'm not worried about you. You will win anyways. Anyway, I knew there was nothing to be done. He was the prime minister. He was the head honcho. He decides, and we have got to follow. I must say that Jeremy, since 1993, since my first election, have always assumed the responsibility at my elections. He was at the uh, director of uh, uh, elections office, local director of elections. Uh, and he was the one communicating to us the results as they were just calculated, tabulated at the, at the, at the, at the at this office. So, of course, uh, on the Saturday before the wedding, I uh, rushed to New York. I see my brothers and all the family and so on, and of course my son, and I'm introduced to the new in-law that we didn't know. Anyways, uh, he was a, a Sephardi Jew from Greece originally, but moved to New York to, to the States when he was very young. She was of a, a Syrian descent. Uh, they met at the University of Buffalo. I mean, my, my Jeremy and his uh, wife, sorry. They met at the University of Buffalo. And here go the stories. So I'm there. I cannot stay for long. And of course, uh, on the uh, uh, right after the wedding, I rush back to Montreal to complete my election, to be there for the day of elections. You've got to go around all the voting stations and shake hands with everybody and be present. That's what you have to do. And my wife, Nicole, stays behind. And my uh, uh, I, 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 I do what I've got to do. And around 4 o'clock in the afternoon, on the day of on the voting day, that means the 28th, Ren, chief of staff, tells me, a change of plan, you've got to go to that location. I was scheduled to go to another location. He said, no, no, you go to that location here, uh, which is called the Centre Socioculturel à Brossard. That's the place you've got to go, because some people are waiting for you there. They want to shake hands with you. I go to that place. And from behind a bush, just as I'm walking to that place, I see Jeremy and his wife. And Nicole. They came back from New York. My son and my daughter in law had reorganized their honeymoon trip to make sure that they would be with me for elections and that Jeremy could achieve his responsibility of going to the office for the tally and informing us about the results. I mean, that's a powerful, powerful family feeling. Powerful. Uh, I won. I was reappointed re to cabinet. Uh, and of course, as is customary, you go to uh, the Governor General's uh, Riddle Hall for the uh, swearing in ceremony. And traditionally, there is a reception for the cabinet members and their families at uh, 24 Sussex, Prime Minister's residence. So I was with uh, Nicole and Jacob, our latest son, uh, youngest son was with us. So we have the ceremony and so on. And then we go to the 24 Sussex. And at 24 Sussex, of course, Paul Martin and his wife, Sheila, would welcome everybody coming. As we walk in, Uh, Paul Martin hugs Nicole warmly and says, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And she says, why are you sorry for? And I'm next to him and I don't understand what's going on here. And neither is Sheila, by the way. <laughs> Nobody knows what's going on, but he's sorry. And he says, you remember Jacques when you told me not to hold your election, elections on 28th because you had your son's wedding on 27th and you suggested that we should do it early July? I couldn't do, do it early July because that's the date where my son was getting married. <laughs> so I'd rather sacrifice you and your marriage, your son's marriage, than sacrifice my son's marriage. 
and I feel guilty about it. And that's why he was apologizing for it. Uh, I'll finish with uh, one very quick one. Uh, it was in uh, late spring 2008. Uh, Ren, this famous lady who's almost like a sister to me, calls me up and she says, uh, Jacques, uh, would you be free tomorrow afternoon? Yeah, why? Uh, have you ever met Justin Trudeau? I said, no. I met his father. I have very fond mem memories of his father. I know. And Ren had been a friend of the family, of the Trudeau family for a long while. She said, look, uh, Justin Trudeau is supposed to meet with the Jewish community at Leo Kohlberg's, uh, Kohlberg's place, Senator Leo Kohlberg. Uh, and he's afraid he doesn't have much knowledge about the issues concerning the Jewish world in Israel and so on. And when he said it to me, I said, well, you should meet with Jacques. And uh, would you agree to meet him and take some time to explain to him at least the fundamentals? I said, sure. We spent a number of hours, all afternoon actually, talking about Jews, our history, Israel, the significance, the meaningfulness of Israel to us, the fact that we were Canadians, and therefore we were not one block, sinking one block. We had our differences. I explained to him that in Canada, uh, Jews are concerned about the same things as any other Canadian. It is not that Israel or Jewish issues replace the rest. They are added to the rest. But we have the same concerns as everybody else. We're concerned about the economy, about the well-being of our senior citizens. We're concerned about our youth, education. We're concerned about uh, the issues which are of common concern. But we have on top of that a concern, which is given to us by our birth, as a Jew, or by adher our adherence to Jewishness, and given to us by belief, by our belief, that our identity was born in the Middle East, and that Israel epitomizes the survival of our people and the hope for our people. And I explained to that, I explained all this to him. He had all kinds of questions, so many questions. He was truly, truly interested. He was truly, truly eager to uh, um, to become sensitive, to know what to do not and what not to do, but it's more than that, to actually know, to actually discover what was motivating us. And I have very fond memories of this. I could go on and on with so many other anecdotes, but I figured uh, I would give you those ones and hope uh, that you would have enjoyed them. Thank you so much. I don't know if anybody has questions. Maybe Gladys, I don't know if Gladys or who is there, uh, uh, maybe. Uh, is that Francoise who is uh, taking care of questions or? I'm sorry, can you? I have, I, I, I don't see the questions. They just come and pop up and I don't have time to read them. So maybe you can, you can open your mic and, 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 and ask your question. I have a question from uh, Mr. Benaim, I believe. Is that possible? If it is true, please, Mr. Benaim, could you unmute un 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 yourself and, and go with your question? Okay. Uh, can you talk a little bit about your early days in Tunisia and France? Sure. Uh, I was a very happy child. Uh, I was a very, very happy child. Uh, I had parents who were extremely caring. Uh, 
very modest, very, very modest, but always dignifying, always respectful. Um, I had a childhood which was marked by friendships. I remember uh, very vividly uh, that I was playing with friends of uh, Italian descent and, uh, and, and, and Arabs and other Jewish kids and uh, we were in school together. We, there was no difference. I'm talking here from the eyes of a kid, of the child that was. Uh, I have very fond memories of uh, Sunday afternoons where I would walk with my parents uh, in a traditional promenade, in a traditional walk to a, a park where my father would run to chase butterflies, uh, white butterflies. Uh, and on the way back, we would stop uh, at uh, uh, a place where you had the announcement of the sports result uh, uh, in, a, in, a, in a press, uh, Tunisian press institution. Uh, I uh, started to feel uh, a bit, at least I had some questions. Uh, when I turned eight or so, it was in 1956. My parents uh, would meet, would gather in the house of, in, in the apartment of a neighbor who was not Jewish, by the way, but who were close friends, and uh, listen to the radio and the news about the Sinai and, uh, and, and, and the war of 56. Uh, we had heroes, uh, of course, Ben Gurion. Uh, we, we were. Uh, we were immersed in, 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 into the, the, our Jewishness, but without any, you know, it wasn't an issue. It, it, it wasn't, it, it was just simply something normal. But in 56, my parents decided to go to France to visit. And I had overheard some of the discussions. And I was getting concerned because the discussions were not about vacation. The discussion was about discovery exploration of, of the possibilities. That's where I started to become aware of the fact that it could be the end for this childhood. Uh, we came to, in, in 56 to Paris. We went to Paris in 56, spent some time with family and so on, had moved before us, went back to Tunisia. And then the atmosphere changed. The atmosphere changed, not, not that much in terms of government. I mean, I, I couldn't see it, but not in terms of government. Uh, actually, I, all I heard was that Abi uh, Bourguiba wasn't too bad for Jews. Uh, but uh, there was some, the beginning of some form of arrogance that I could see in, on the streets or in school. Uh, for the first time, incidents occurred that made me feel Jewish. Uh, in 1958, uh, my parents were afraid. If they were, we were not forced. We we're not refugees in the sense of refugees from Syria or Egypt, for instance. We are not refugees. Actually, my my grandparents on both sides became French in 1926. So I was French by birth. Uh, so I wasn't going to be a refugee. I was just simply repatriated to France, as I said. Okay. Uh, but uh, it wasn't the government that my parents feared. I think my parents feared, feared the street. You know, uh, when you had demonstrations uh, after, um, for instance, Charlie Hebdo, something like this, uh, people gather in respect in dignity, in togetherness. But sometimes the streets gathers in, uh, in heinous uh, motivations, uh, in, uh, in the desire to, to hurt, to break, or even to kill. It is that street that my parents feared. And they feared that they felt that it was time for them to go. So they decided to go. No decision was made by government for them. They decided to go. And on the January, January 25, 1958, 
we boarded a ship uh, which was going to take us uh, to Marseille from Tunis. And uh, on the bottom, uh, on, on, the, on, the, on the wharf, there was uh, my father's elder brother, older brother, and uh, the lady who took care of me all my youth, Fatma, was working with us at the, our apartment. They were waving at us and they became smaller and smaller. The boat, the ship was moving. I didn't know then, but uh, this January 25, 1958, was the date my childhood, childhood ended. Jacques, you have another question? Uh, yes. When was this meeting with Justin Trudeau from Lisette Chachoua? When was it? When was this meeting with Justin Trudeau from Lisette Chachoua? It was in, uh, in the spring of 2008. It was before his first election. He was, he was running for Papineau as a member of parliament. But he wasn't elected yet, it was before his election. So I suppose it was uh, around May or June 2008. But yeah, uh, uh, eight, yeah, he was elected in October 2008. So it was before that. Any other questions? I have one. Go ahead. Can you yes. hear Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Uh, Mr. Sada, I don't know if you can comment, but I would like to know uh, what do you think of Trudeau's policy of bringing a lot of Muslim immigrants into the country? We as Jews are always worried, especially when you grew up in the Middle East, you're always worried about too many Muslims around you. I'm going to answer very directly. I do not share this fear. I'm not worried about this. And I'm going to tell you why I'm not worried about it. I've had so many experiences with Muslims that I cannot generalize and say Muslims are against us. I cannot uh, generalize and uh, label people because of the place they were born in or because of the religion they have. If you talk to me about being safe, then we've got to look at the measures taken to ensure as much as possible safety of our country and of us Jews here. For instance, the selection of, of these families was made abroad in refugee camps with a criteria which are the same criteria as the criteria by the UN in terms of recognition of refugee status. They were examined with priorities. We received in priorities families where the, uh, uh, the man was killed or, or, or not able to fulfill his duties, or you know, his family duty. We uh, worked with churches and organized groups, which are very decent groups and organizations, very respected groups and organizations and families. I have no reason whatsoever to believe these people are going to harm us. If you look at the uh, anti-Semitic incidents, especially here in Quebec, none of them, never, ever. It was always people who were converted or who claimed they were converted, who were motivated by hate, but it wasn't them. I'm not worried about this. I truly am not. Thank you. I have a question, Jack, if I may. Sure, yeah. uh, You worked very closely with uh, Pierre Elliott Trudeau, working, had a good working relationship with him. If you were in politics today, do you think you could have a similar kind of relationship with his son, Justin, in terms of politics? Yeah, indeed. Indeed, I could. And I could also tell him that I don't agree with him on some things. Uh, in the last vote uh, on the UN, just at the time when it was, you know, it was between elections and so on, Canada made the wrong decision on the UN vis-a-vis -vis Israel. 
And I would tell him exactly the same thing as I would have told the father. This is wrong. This is wrong. And why is it wrong? It is wrong mainly because there is a game being played at the UN against Israel. No matter what the issue is, no matter what the contents are, the resolutions presented at the UN are not aimed at solving a problem. They are aimed at targeting Israel and therefore falling into the trap of giving in on substance is forgetting the big picture. And the big picture is politics around making Israel a demon. We cannot fall into that trap. So that's what I would have told Justin Trudeau if I were next to him. Exactly that. Thank you. By the way, uh, on this issue, uh, and I know the, the question, of course, on Trudeau, uh, Albert was, uh, uh, you know, uh, fringing on, on, on the issue of relationship with Israel and so on. Uh, you know, it's, 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 it's funny enough. I don't know if I have it around here. But I, I, I had a debate a few I had a debate a few days ago, a few weeks ago, sorry, uh, explaining uh, the ridiculous character of these resolutions presented at the UN. I'm going to give you an example. If at the UN you have as Vice President of the Human Rights Commission, Libya, under Gaddafi. If you have at the UN more resolutions against Israel alone, than against than all other resolutions around the world together. This little tiny country is the subject of so many resolutions. Look, the I think it was the UNESCO, I'm sure it was UNESCO Commission, uh, had a report in 2015, I believe. This report totally, totally ignored the Jewish presence in Jerusalem. I mean, it was blatant to such a point that the director general, the executive director of UNESCO, her name is Irida uh, Bukova, wrote a letter under her letterhead as executive director of UNESCO, denouncing this report. By the way, France was Part of the signatories of the report. That's another thing. Not uh, surprising. They had issued this report where they denied the presence of Jews in Jerusalem. I mean, presence of Jews in the Middle East dates over 3,000 years. It's proven. If we believe, we can go farther, but proven. One almost 1,500 years before the birth of Christianity. Over 2,000 years before the birth of, more than 3,000 years before the birth of Islam. How can you say that Jews were not there at that time? How can you distort history and facts to that extent? I had a chance to meet with Irina Bukova when she was in Montreal. I was out of politics at the time, but I was invited to a, a, a dinner that she was a guest speaker, and uh, where she was a guest speaker. And I had I had a chance to go to her and explain to her that I admired her courage. She was risking her position, and she dared to denounce. So this craziness. We live in a world where craziness is taking over. <laughs> where all kinds of news are just simply absorbed and distributed and taken for granted, where people are manipulating the reality and, and, and so many people believe it. It is just simply mind boggling. We have a tremendous job to do in terms of making sure, and I'm not going to talk about the whole rest of the world and the whole rest of the issues, but we have to safeguard against manipulation aimed at anti-Semitism or anti-Zionism. That must be a mission of every single day, of every single minute on all fronts, whether it's in Canada, whether it's in political, local politics, whether it's at the UN, with, on the international stage, I don't care. 
each one does it its own, with its own ability and measure. But that's a mission we have to fulfill on a constant, constant, constant basis. Correct. Other questions for Zach? Well, je crois que les gens sont fatigués, non? <laughs> Léon, go ahead. Oui. Léon. Jacques, je dois te dire que je suis. Tu as fendu mon cœur. I don't know if I have to say it in English. What, what's the, most of the people are English speaking or listening or what is it? What's the. Doesn't matter. I'm, I'm sure. He touched your heart. English, please. I'm sorry. English, touched please. Your heart. Yes. Well, what's my heart is I know Jacques for many, many, many years when he came back from France, and I lost him, unfortunately, for different circumstances. You know, he went to politics. I went to something else, but something else hurt. I mean, something else pleased me so much to hear from him because I belong to the Holocaust Museum of Montreal. I'm a child survivor of the Holocaust. I was a hidden child during the, the, the war. And what Jack says about his openness, his opening in all community. I agree so much with you, Jacques, and it's fantastic. Unfortunately, et malheureusement, il y a beaucoup de personnes ici au Canada qui n'ont pas connu cette époque. Moi, je sais que toi, tu l'as connu. Tu l'as connu de Tun partant de Tunisie en rentrant en France et de partir de France, partir en Israël et partir euh, revenir au Canada. Donc, je comprends un petit peu ta route. Elle est Elle n'est pas similaire à la mienne, mais elle ressemble beaucoup. J'ai passé trois ans en Algérie, euh, dans l'armée française, et j'ai été prisonnier euh, dans une infirmerie avec des Arabes, des gens qui ne savaient pas ce que c'était un Juif. Alors j'ai eu beaucoup de beaucoup d'expériences, et tout ce que tu as raconté vis-à-vis -vis des musulmans, je suis tout à fait d'accord, et c'est une très grande C est, c est, c est, si, si tu étais en France, je t'aurais donné la Légion d'honneur. Peut-être que peut M. Macron devrait te la donner, parce que des personnes comme toi sur cette planète, il n'y en a pas beaucoup. Et je voudrais te remercier. Je suis tellement content pour toi, pour Nicole, pour tes enfants que je connais, évidemment. Et j'aimerais te remercier. Tu m'as fait vraiment, tu m'as touché. On ne on s'est pas vu dernièrement pour, pour la circonstance du Covid, mais aussitôt que tout ça sera terminé, il faudra qu'on se revoie. Merci, avec grand plaisir. Merci, Merci à toi. Avec grand plaisir. Avec grand, grand plaisir. Et tu passes un gros bonjour à la maison de ma part. Merci. Merci. Okay. Tu peux te demander une autre question, Jacques mais Bien sûr, bien sûr avec, plaisir, avec plaisir. Tu n'as jamais eu l'occasion d'avoir l'expérience de passer un été à la goulette en <rire> Tu me poses des questions sur ma vie privée auxquelles je ne répondrai pas. <rire> mais tu sais que euh, la goulette, c'est très significatif. Je vais vous raconter une petite chose très rapide. C'est pour ça que je suis euh, ce maybe, maybe I will say it in English to make sure that I'm not losing anybody. Uh, uh, Albert is asking a question about La Goulette. La Goulette is uh, actually it's it's the real harbor. Tunis is an artificial harbor. Uh, La Goulette is five kilometers away, and it's just the real harbor. Uh, I went to Tunis. That's another anecdote I could have told you, but anyways, I went to Tunis uh, in 2005, uh, January 2005. Uh, there were meetings, you know, bilateral meetings between Tunisia and, uh, and 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 Canada. And a commission had been established, and they met once in Canada, once in Tunis. So I was representing Canada in Tun Tunis for this bilateral. And of course, you can imagine those of you people who know, who come from Middle Eastern countries or from North African countries, you know the kind of hospitality you can you can get uh, in this country. So they welcomed me as 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 a 
you know, as a son of the country was returning. Uh, and so with the motorcade and the flags on the hood and the whole thing, we are uh, uh, driving through La Goulette. And all of a sudden I see on the left-hand side, a building with an inscription in half circle on top of the building in Hebrew. So I'm intrigued. I asked to stop the motorcade. Now, motorcade means the, uh, the, the bicycle, uh, not bicycle, motorcycle, actually. Motorcycle in front of us, the two cars of security around me, the whole thing blocks off the streets. <laughs> Everything is just stopped that I could get out. And I go into this building and I ask, this was a building which was reserved for senior citizens, Jewish senior citizens, who had no family left and who were taken care of by the government of Tunisia. The government of Tunisia was paying everything in this place. So anyways, that's just to, to tell you about La Goulette. It was, uh, that's it, what it reminded me. But La Goulette also, the movie is, is, is a symbol. We used to live together, Jews, Christians, and Muslims all together. We were having sometimes the same way of life. We were having the same, you know, we had similar traditions in many regards. The only thing we didn't do much was to get intermarriages. But apart from that, we were living the same way. You know, in Jerba, which is nine of the south of uh, Tunis, Tunisia, I visited the museum. And Jerba is a small island with a, like a hill. On top of the hill, there is a museum. So I went to the museum with Nicole uh, a few years ago. And I visited the museum and it was scenes of everyday life, you know, uh, a kitchen, a bedroom, uh, and so on. So I, I asked the, 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 uh, the guide, I said, is it, a, is it an Arab, uh, uh, the description of Arab way of life or because Jews are the same, he said, well, that's, that could be either. It was exactly the same. In Jerba, which has one of the uh, holiest sanctuaries of Jewish uh, tradition, which is the uh, uh, Ribra, okay, which is a synagogue in, uh, on Jerba, uh, Jews and Arabs used to live without, without any problem. No, not a single problem, but in the same way of life. They had the same concerns, they had the same rights, they had the same, you know, the only thing they didn't do was to marry. But the rest was the same, identical. Sorry, it was a long answer to your question, <laughs> Albert. Thank you, Jacques. Jacques, can I ask a question, please? Sure. Ah, it's Rosy, je reconnais la voix. Je te vois pas, mais je te reconnais la voix. Ah oui, c'est ça. C'est moi. <laughs> tu me vois ah, maintenant? Ah, je te vois, je te vois, c'est bon. D'accord. Um, I wanted to ask you: Would you, would you ever, would you consider going back to politics, or is it something that is of the past? You've had it, you're happy with it, and you're just moving on. Past. Uh, it is a past. Uh, I'm going to tell you one anecdote. You're going to laugh. Okay. When I drive, I hate people who cannot drive. I hate people who cut me off and so on, and they yell, and I, you know, I, I, I manifest my disappointment or my, my fury. And of course, when I decided to run for office the first time, I couldn't do that because the guy who was crossing me or cutting me off maybe was a voter. I couldn't. <laughs> and he made the voter. So I kept it inside me. And I went on like this for years. The day I was out of politics, I can tell you the first guy who cut me off, he got it all together. I <laughs> pushed it all out of my body. All to say, it was an anecdote, a joke, but all to say that... Uh, when you get into politics, you lose your freedom. Without being aware of it, little by little, you lose your freedom. You are a member of a political party. Uh, you have got to make decisions and sometimes decisions of the party are not in, too in line with what you think. Uh, at some point, you've got to accept that you are a member of the family and the family moves in one direction. And even though, so in cabinet, it's even worse because Cabinet, that's, you know, you swore in to this loyalty to the cabinet. So uh, you lose your freedom. You cannot walk on the street without being called upon by anybody to talk about your job or an issue. 
uh, you, you cannot have any free time, except if you leave the country and you go somewhere else in Ireland, but you don't have any free time. What is your job is of interest to everybody. And therefore you are never, you never have a downtime, ever. So when you leave politics, you rediscover freedom. And, 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 and that's a beautiful feeling. Now, it doesn't mean that I'm not involved in politics. I'm involved in different kind of politics. First of all, it's the politics that I choose. If I decided to run and, 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 and if, I, if I'm president of the Communauté Sefarade Unité du Québec, I chose to do it. Bravo. If I'm president of the South Shore Jewish community, I chose to do it. I'm a member of the executive of CJA, the organization which is in charge of government relations for the Jewish community. It's a choice. I have accepted to be a member of the board of the Montreal Holocaust Museum. It's a choice. I'm free to do that. And in all of those fronts, I'm involved with politics, different kind of politics. So I, I, I do continue to love politics, to enjoy it thoroughly, but I enjoy my freedom and I want to continue having it. Beautiful. Yeah, I understand. I understand. Jacques. Jacques. Yes. Je voudrais à mon tour te remercier infiniment d'être présent avec nous aujourd'hui et pourtant pour tes témoignages extrêmement émouvants qui portent tous sur tes valeurs du judaïsme, ton amour pour Israël, ton amour pour notre peuple, pour le Canada et pour ta vision pour le futur. En association avec la CESQ, nous allons pouvoir accomplir beaucoup de choses ensemble. Et je souhaite que tu puisses poursuivre ta vision, ton mandat de réunification des personnes, des peuples, pendant longtemps encore. Exact. Jacques, merci Amen. d'avoir été avec nous ce matin. Nous aurions, nous aurions pu t'écouter pendant encore plusieurs heures <rire> parce que ta présentation était émouvante et sincère, surtout très sincère et qui vient du cœur. Alors, merci infiniment, Jacques. Merci. Merci à vous de m'avoir invité. Merci beaucoup. Merci Edmond, beaucoup. I would like, uh, can I make a comment? Uh, Jacques, uh, you know, there are a few individuals Uh, who walk the face of the earth, they just can't help it, but they are just full of light and they're like a receptacle and their light shines 360 degrees around them. You know, uh, you are one of them. You can't yeah. even help it. You're just, you, you know, humanity just sings from your energy and Why am I saying this? Because I've seen it before. Uh, it, it, I've seen it. It's rare, but it's, it's possible. Um, you remind me, <laughs> pardon this, but you remind me of my father. Um, he was in prison and he was translating the Hebrew Bible to his cellmates. And they were all Muslim. And he... They, they would ask him to pray for them. Uh, and, and pretty soon everybody was doing a speaker event, each one from their angle, from their perspective, from what they used to do. And they were all excited who's going to be the next speaker. There are some people who inspire humanity and others, and it just is so natural for them. And um, it, it, It's a miracle. We need you as a politician, but we need you to be here, be there, speak here, speak there. We need people like you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Andra. Thank you. Appreciate it. I say something else? I forgot. On the last time that I spoke to you, I, we 
we decided, enfin, you decide, not me, you decided to be much closer because I was asking you, you know, I'm Ashkenaz and you are half and half because of your wife. But I was asking you to have the community of the Sotro and the whole community everywhere, Sepharad or Ashkenaz to be much closer because we yeah. all Jews, we all Jews. And I'm doing that, I'm involved a lot myself with the children, with all the school, Jewish school, Erzelia, I've, I've been a speaker to uh, Spanish, Portuguese many, many times. I've been to the Hebrew Association, I've been to Catholic school, to Muslim school, and this is, I am a little bit of view, you know, that you want to reunite everybody. And that's my wish for the rest of my life, because uh, I'm a little older than you, but of course, but mm -hmm. you know that, our, well, not far. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you know what I went through my life and um, I think the education of this planet today start with the kid in school. That's our future for our children and our grandchildren. Yeah. Leon, you say, we can talk about this when we move. Uh, oh, it, it could be a, a topic by itself. The history yeah. between Ashkenazis and, and, and Sephardim and uh, the fact that these divisions have got to be overcome. And if you want to overcome them, the first step to take is to overcome them locally, locally meaning Montreal. Let's build bridges between these communities. We are Jewish, Absolutely. first and foremost. Absolutely. Okay? And, and, and that's my philosophy. And that's why the CSTQ is so much closer to Federation than ever before, that we have shared programs, shared initiatives, that we, we, that we, we work together very close. We can, we can discuss this matter a bit later because it's a topic of its own, but I, I, I fully concur. Thank you, thank you, Jacques. Merci beaucoup à vous tous. Je pense que tout le monde commence à être fatigué, ça commence à être long. Euh, Edmond, merci beaucoup de tes paroles. Euh, vraiment, elles me touchent. Euh, thank you, thank you, Sandra, for your words and everybody else and Leon and Harry. Euh, merci et au plaisir de vous reparler bientôt, j'espère. I hope we can talk again soon. Thank you so much, everybody. Avant de terminer, Jacques, je voudrais juste t'inviter avec la communauté du South Shore de venir passer un Shabbat avec nous en Espagne. Après, après le Covid, après l'histoire du Covid, on pourra faire un Shabbat en ensemble. Avec grand plaisir. Avec un grand, grand plaisir. That would be nice. Very nice day. offer, Edmond. I like it. Thank you. Yeah. Thank I you, Jacques. Indeed. Thank you indeed. Thank you. And uh, Thank one you. last word. One last word, please. Stay safe. Be very careful. Be extra careful. In a few months, we will have spring, and with spring, hope. And the hope means that we will get rid of this virus. In the meantime, please make sure you stay safe. Amen. Okay. Thank, Thank you. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you very Bye -bye. much. For an amazing presentation. And maybe you, one of these days, what maybe one of these days we can organize a group trip to an Etia La Goulette. <laughs> 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 yeah, if they change government because the one in place now is not very is not very inviting for this. It uh, might happen. One of these days it, it may be it, possible. It will change. It will change one day. Everything changes. Thanks a lot again for being with us. Appreciate Thank it. You. Thank be you well so much. And be safe. Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup. Merci, Jacques. Merci, Jacques. Merci, Jacques. Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup, Jacques. Merci. Au revoir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was a great speech from a great man. That was so <laughs> Thank beautiful. you so much. Thank you. It was amazing. Through Thank your you wisdom, much. courage, and hard work, you reached all these high positions in serving Canada and Israel. It was so a great, much. informative, how you showed us 
step by step. We learned a lot. We learned about your great personality and we learned how you, you reached all these beautiful positions. You couldn't do it any differently. You deserved you. it with all your personality and your approach and uh, your love to humanity and you like to bring people together. The same as you did today. You brought us together, even with our president who didn't come recently. <laughs> yeah, but 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 this one here, I must refuse what you said. I didn't bring people together. You did. <laughs> okay, Gladys. Let's not confuse things here. <laughs> you take good care, oh, everybody. To, we'll see you. Okay, take care. Thing. The moment you...